So Kevin, just explain where we are at the moment. So we're at the southern end of the East Dunes on the Gibraltar Point National Nature Reserve and the view over to the east, we're looking right out over the wash. Um, the wash embayment there, it's low tide at the moment and you can see the exposed sandbars which are home to the internationally important population of harbour seals at the moment. They've all got their pups. Um, and also at the moment we've got very high tides which are bringing all the wading birds off the mud flats where it's not possible for them to feed when the feeding grounds get covered by the tide. So they all come up here to roost. We had about 40,000 knot this morning on the high tide with about 40,000? Indeed, yeah. Already over here from Greenland, possibly as far away as Arctic Canada. So they've already had a long journey so for them it's definitely autumn. I've brought the binoculars, great viewing point here. I don't need the binoculars to see the North Norfolk coast. Well it's about 15 miles away so lucky today we've got clear visibility um, and that really demarcates the, uh, the kind of the other extreme of, of the wash, the mouth of the wash between sort of Hunstanton and, um, and Gibraltar Point. And very similar habitats in some respects. A lot of bird watchers go to North Norfolk, they'll be seeing similar things to what we have here in Lincolnshire. Absolutely, to some extent it's a mirror image. We've got sand dunes, um, internationally important sand dunes, and we've got salt marshes and, and mud flats, and indeed we share the uh, the wash with, with Norfolk, of course. Yeah, and no. the, birds, the birds and the seals don't know boundaries. <laughs> indeed not, and, and nor do the birds in the sky, because we've just had some spoonbill going over. Yep, yeah, five spoonbills have just gone over, lovely view. Um, they don't nest here in Lincolnshire, although we hope that one day they might. Um, but really it's only a short hop for, for them from their breeding grounds on the North Norfolk coast. Um, so they, they start to come over here from about June time and they bring their young over um, and we've got good feeding grounds at the moment. We're going to focus on birds and bird numbers because this is really where it all started. We talk about Ted Smith uh, from the early days of the Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust and this is where it began for him as well. Very much so. Um, so he visited uh, Gibraltar Point before the Second World War um, and uh, during, the, during the Second World War the military occupied this whole site um, they took it over they evicted the local community local businesses local farming and so on um, so they could use it as a strategic defense point and a training ground um, fortunately after the war when ted smith came back you know he saw that largely um, it was uh, it was unspoilt um, and the dunes and the salt marshes remained intact and he quickly set about gathering uh, a, a cohort of like-minded people such as lenton ottaway one of his birding buddies at the time, um, and uh, very quickly set up the, the bird observatory, and that became operational uh, in 1949. And were they literally just counting the birds as they were flying or sort of landing in the shrubbery and those sorts of things, or were they catching birds as well? Well, a bit of both really, because Ted had sort of learnt the trade from um, from Scott Combe Bird Observatory, where he'd done a bit of a recce and met Ronald Lockley, um, and so he was kind of conforming to the early protocols of what a bird observatory was all about. So primarily the study of migration um, and, uh, you know, recording breeding birds and, and so on. He was quite pleased to see the, the, the big colonies of breeding birds they have at uh, a Scott home. And indeed here we have our own little tern colony uh, out on the beach, the last remaining little terns in Lincolnshire now. Um, so an important colony there. But They're the ones that you, you watch at night, aren't they? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah 24 yeah. hour warning scheme for, yes. for them because they're so important. So they have a range of issues, a range of factors um, which can stop them producing young um, and uh, so we try and control those factors to a, a greater degree as much as possible but that m much of that area is set aside for the breeding birds um, and then we have the sort of the visitor beach to the north. We're going to go into the observatory area in a moment but I want to talk a bit about how the birds are actually caught you know when, when you're doing this monitoring and there's a structure that's just to the side of us here isn't there? Sure. Well, that's the that's the Heligoland trap. A um, what? A Heligoland trap. Okay. So named Not a merry-go-round. <laughs> <No. laughs> Although sometimes the ringers might think it is. Um, but that is so named because it was designed on the Isle of Heligoland, which is an early uh, bird observatory uh, off the German coast. Um, and it's basically like uh, a funnel shape uh, covered in netting that the, uh, the bird, bird ringers actually chivvy the birds into that through the scrub and then ultimately the birds are caught in a catching box and then they're taken over to the observatory building there where they're individually identified and measured and weighed uh, and so on and, th and then they're ringed. So like a funnel, like a duck decoy exactly, type thing? Exactly, yeah? like a duck decoy. Yeah, and is that right. still used now? It is, yeah, because on windy days um, it's, it's good to use because you can't necessarily use a mist net which would flap around in the wind. But 
Heligoland traps were used in the early days of bird observatories and then mist nets came in later on and the netting is such that you can cut a ride um, or a gap between two areas of scrub and then hang the net up um, and then it's so such fine mesh that it just blends in with the background and the birds don't see it and they end up flying into the net and then they're caught effectively in pockets in the nets. And do you set the nets up? Was a kestrel just behind us there, just d dipping down behind the hedge there. Uh, yeah. Do you set the nets up dependent upon the sort of birds you're hoping to catch or is it just very random? The really important thing about bird observatories and, and this constant recording effort is that you're basically setting nets up pretty much in the same area that they were set up back in the early days um, and you're, you're catching for the same amount of time pretty much so it, it's quite structured and it's quite standardized so you can pretty much compare the data that you're getting today to the data that they were getting in 1949 with the same length of netage in the same area and it's fascinating because we were just in the office before we came out to, to look at this wonderful view here, looking at the records that go right back, don't they? To 1949, the 11th of April 1949, and we have the original logbook um, into which you know Ted wrote the details of the first bird that was caught in the first Heligoland trap, and that was a willow warbler on the 11th of April. In fact, I'm I'm corrected actually. I think. Um, I'm told that Mary, his wife, would actually do the scribing because Ted's handwriting was so bad. Really? So man after my own. <laughs> and me. My wife would have to do the writing for me as well. But isn't it wonderful to have that record now to look at? Yeah, it, it really is. I mean, you know, it almost puts sort of, you know, a shiver up your spine when you just look at that and think that, you know, that was being written in, in, in on the 11th of April 1949. Quite incredible piece of history. And we were talking on the way to the viewpoint here about the fact that when you look back at those records, you can see what's changed in terms of birds that we're seeing here now that we wouldn't have been there, like red kite, for example. Very much so. In 1949, when records started, um, there were no red kites other than a small population in, in Wales. Obviously, that's been a success story nationwide. Um, and today we, we see red kites very regularly here. In fact, we've had a migration of about 30 in one day in, in May. But again, all, all that's recorded. Um, but the, the other thing about, you know, whatever we're recording, it's as important to record the common birds and their population changes in respect of, you know, different factors that affect them, um, as well as, you know, seeing things that are like red kites or little egrets that might be newcomers. Um, you know, or indeed rarities. We've had one or two birds over from America and, and such like. Really interesting point because we always assume we will always have house sparrows and blackbirds. Until they go. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that's the thing, until, until their population's declined. And house sparrows are a really good case in point because house sparrows were so common that when I first started recording as a young lad, um, I just thought they were too common to record, you know. Yeah, yes. <laughs> and I think oh, you always see those, and starlings, it, they're always there, yeah, aren't exactly. they? You know? Yeah, and, and I think at the time they were deemed so common that people were told not to ring them, you know, don't waste that metal, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but, but now nothing could be further from the truth. We need to know, you know, what's happening with the populations of our common birds because they're the barometers, the countryside and the climate, you know, that they, they indicate to us, you know, what's going wrong, uh, potentially, that we can then explore those factors and hopefully mitigate for them. Let's go down into the building that I'm going to describe as very functional. Um, was this an old military building? Yeah, it did function as a as a military building in the Second World War, and you can see to the uh, to just behind it, there's an old Shelley shelter as well. So this is like a communications building, um, but this is where the bird observatory started. This this is the bird observatory, and this is where Ted and Lenton spent the early days uh, in the in the early 50s. They they would come over and they would literally sleep in here. Um, and the and the adjacent building, which they actually called the cathedral. I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go down and have a look inside. Sure. Oh, lovely. We've come into the observatory area here now, and this is where all the action takes place. But you've brought some records along, Kevin, including the very first records. Indeed. So this logbook here that we're looking at um, has actually got an entry from the 11th of April 1949. So this is the original logbook, the original um, handwriting and, and the first birds to be recorded at the observatory. So it says here the first swallows flew to the southwest at half seven in the evening. And, and then also... underneath willow warbler trapped in and ringed at 
1945, so quarter to eight in the evening. Exactly. Um, so that was the first bird to ever be ringed at Gibraltar Point Bird Observatory. Um, and at that time, early April, it would have just flown up from um, tropical Africa, um, would be looking to, you know, uh, to, to nest here on the nature reserve. We were talking about the trapping and, the, and that side of things. And there's an image just above us on the side here of um, a bird that's been caught in one of the mist nets. They don't get damaged at all, do they? No, it's a very, very fine net. And the thing is, the, uh, the ringers who are, who are trained um, and, um, and licensed, they actually have to check the nets on a very regular basis um, to make sure that birds aren't sort of, well, left hanging, basically. Yeah, and the nets are actually behind us, aren't they? We've just had a look at the, the containers here. That's where they are, ready to go out on the next check. Exactly. A bit windy today for ringing, yeah. but hopefully once we get this bad weather period out of the way in the next few days, then you know the, the ringers will resume. But field work goes on every day, you know, counting the birds. That still goes on. Um, and sometimes, you know, that will be geared towards what the wind is doing. For, exa for example, if you've got a strong northerly wind, then people will get the telescopes out and look at the sea because quite often really exciting seabirds turn up in, uh, in strong northerly winds. But conversely, on the southwesterly winds, like on that, um, that April day, a lot of birds actually fly south, um, even in the spring. <laughs> so are the records still kept by hand? Right, basically we've got a, um, a file here that um, every month we file the, the, the handwritten records. and then, well, This one here? That's right, they're all collated because different people send in different records, different days, different times, different areas covered. So we had to collate all that together on a daily field sheet and then that now gets input onto the national system which is called BirdTrack. Okay, uh, this one here, you brought a folder along, which is usually kept in the office, September 2023. So a year ago, let's have a go, let's just pick out one here. And this would just be, this happens every day? Every day, that's okay. right, exactly. Let's have a little look here, what can we see? What's of note? Uh, well, I'll tell you what I have spotted here. Not 81,200 just of not yes so that looks like one of my records because i'm not a ringer but i, I is that do your handwriting <laughs> yes exactly yeah i made the effort there <laughs> <laughs> um so uh, yes um gibraltar point is internationally important for a whole range of wading birds that occur here on migration and then many of them spend the winter with us um, so september is really the peak month for a lot of these birds coming through the arctic some of them might be on their way to the um, wintering grounds in West Africa or South Africa. Others may well stay on the wash and, and place like Gibraltar Point for the winter. So now is a good time to be here. It's a very good time to be here. That's right, exactly. These, these numbers are, are building up. So at 81,000, we, we normally get about a peak count of somewhere in the region of 80,000 knot um, ev every autumn. Well, just looking down here, Dunlin, on this same day, 12,000 Dunlin. Exactly, another wading bird, um, many of these birds from the Arctic, again, like with the knot, and um, again, sort of getting near internationally important numbers for, for, for Dunlin. Um, and what's happened on that particular day is it has been a high tide in the morning, and these birds have been feeding on the mudflats where they're probing around for small shellfish and worms, and mollusks, and, and so on, uh, because they're wading birds. Um, and then when the tide comes in and covers the mudflats, then they have to find somewhere to roost, um, effectively go and rest up in great big flocks, a bit like you see the star yeah. starling murmurations, we get the same thing happening here with the wader flocks, um, and they're literally waiting for the, uh, the tide to recede so they can go back and feed. And the harder the weather, particularly in midwinter, the more critical it is that yeah. they can feed in areas like this. So keeping these areas free from disturbance, keeping the habitat in good condition um, is really important, you know, part of the trust work. I can hear people saying, how do you know there were 81,200 not? I mean, how do you count them? Well... It has to be said that it is a bit of an estimate, but yeah. if they're going past in tens, that's fine. If they're going past in fifties, that's fine. Sometimes they're going past in thousands. And you normally get into a position where you can actually watch the birds leaving the, the feeding areas and flying up to roosts. Right. They're all going past you and then you can get... You so know, you take a snapshot a... and say, well, that times this 10 times that number here, estimate it that way. Pretty much, exactly. If you get a big cloud, yep. yeah. I mean, sometimes that you know you can get you can get a flock of birds that looks like it's about two kilometres long as as they funnel out of the wow. yeah, out of the wash. Yeah, just looking here, and we were talking about how things have changed. 
Um, I think it says here, Little Egret, 25. Now, if we went back to 1949, it would have been zero. zero absolutely. <laughs> yeah, nothing. In fact, Little Egret wouldn't have even been on the recording form because no. they wouldn't have anticipated that anyone would see any. Um, so, yeah, incredibly... incredibly Before we actually bird. came out onto the site here, there were several swallows flying over. So, again, is this one of the final points that they'll be on land before they head back? It could well be, exactly. And one of the things that we're noticing about swallows this year is that quite a few people have been ringing us up saying the swallows aren't back in their outbuildings and, and so on. They're real concern about swallows. And we, we share that concern because normally here, even on the nature reserve, we would have seven or eight pairs nesting. And I think the spring was so awful this year, weather-wise, that they arrived late um, and they weren't in good condition. Um, and so they needed to spend time feeding, although the the weather conditions for feeding and the impoverishment of insect populations generally mm. hasn't helped that at all. So we've one of the things that we've noted um, is perhaps an early departure of swallows as well. You know, mm. I think some of them have probably just given up. There are there are some young around that we've seen fledged, but normally swallows would be expected to have you know at least two broods in a in a breeding season. It's really interesting. Also, we talked, didn't we, about ordinary birds if I can call them that yeah, the common yeah. birds and I've just flipped the page over here this was the 15th of September last year uh, 32 wren uh, what else have we got here uh, blackbird 13 so the blackbird was doing okay yeah that's a fairly fairly standard number um, and they're they're local birds they're local breeding birds they're sort of residents if you like um, but later um, in the year, come sort of October, November, we'll then get all the migrant birds through from Northern Europe. And a lot of people are quite surprised to hear that blackbirds actually, um, you know, travel that far across the North Sea when things are getting cold and food is getting scarce up in Scandinavia. Um, hundreds of thousands of blackbirds will actually migrate across the North Sea and end up at sites like Gibraltar Point before they disperse into the wider countryside. Um, so, uh, you know, the blackbirds that people see in their gardens in sort of December, January aren't necessarily the ones that have bred during the summer. And of course, it's just as important to have the smaller numbers as it is the larger numbers. So you can see whether some species are declining. Very much so. I mean, we've got 75 years worth of records now yes. in, uh, in, in those log sheets. Um, so, you know, the potential for analysis. I mean, some of the population trends are, are obvious. Um, you know, some birds like red poles, we just hardly see anymore. They're not a breeding species. Um, you know, other birds like the little egrets that we've mentioned, red kites and so on. But even in 1949, birds like peregrines and sparrowhawks, they just weren't seen. You know, yeah. they were at such low population levels that, you know, another positive has been really good to record their, you know, their, their recovery effectively and, and how common they are now. Uh, I've just spotted another biggie. Uh, Meadow Pippet, 10,200 on this one day. Yeah, I mean, that, that is a really good illustration of, of migration. I mean, that is an exceptional count. Um, and that count was made over about a two or three hour period in the morning where they were all arriving from northern Europe um, as, you know, we're moving into, uh, into deeper into autumn and they're starting to look towards getting towards migration, uh, sorry, to wintering grounds. And we were talking about some of these wading birds. You mentioned about the high tides. It sort of pushes them up. So actually they're good for viewing as well, aren't they? Yeah, very much so. Um, and um, from time to time we do run events for visitors to come along and um, we station people in sort of watch point areas where we're not going to be causing disturbance to the birds and then we can have a look at the, the flocks i mean sometimes look out for the uh, the high tide events at the visitor center you know often they do a high tide breakfast um, and that's really good because you can have your breakfast and then you can watch the huge flocks of waders all going past the visitor center go to the website to find out a bit more about that yep. just looking at the table we've got here set out for us this is the equipment that the ringers uh, will actually use then Yes, so you can see a range of rings, um, all very lightweight rings. Um, so clearly different birds have different size legs. Um, so there are different sizes. For example, you've got your, your small um, A rings there and double A rings, which will go on warblers and gold crests and the like, through to C rings, which will go on the thrushes. Um, and they're mostly the commonly caught, caught birds here, you know, in, in the June scrub. We mentioned blackbirds, so they take... Uh, one of those slightly larger rings there. And I suppose the other thing is, some of the birds that get caught in the nets will already be ringed. And do you keep that record as well? Yeah, again, very important data um, that uh, you know helps to establish the, the migration routes that these birds are taking. And you know as things are at the moment with changes in migration patterns due to climate, 
um, then you know that's important that this range of 20 or so observatories around the UK are all pooling that information so we can learn from. But we're also doing a big project at the moment to try and look for sandwich terns, um, which are very um, common on the beach at the moment. Um, good numbers of those which have come from colonies elsewhere. They don't nest at Gibraltar Point, but mm. s uh, quite often um, the, the sandwich terns will be ringed with a, a colour ring with a code on it. And so you get the colour and you get the code and then we can find out where they've come from. And at the moment we're, um, we're gathering quite a lot of information um, on those colour rings to determine not only where they've come from, but also look at their migration. But it seems like even birds that are coming across from Holland might then take a sort of an anti-clockwise migration route around the UK to hit the Atlantic coast and then migrate south to wintering grounds in a place like Namibia, uh, rather than going down the eastern seaboard of the UK and through the English Channel. So mm. it's just a theory at the moment. Yeah. It's something that, again, ringing is, is helping us to understand. As much as I'd love to stay in the observatory here with all of the uh, spiders, <laughs> let's move on to somewhere else because this is a, an old building here. We talked about the military background. We're going to go just across the way to somewhere where something quite modern is happening in bird tracking. So we're going to have a look at the MOTUS tracking um, and, and that is using modern technology, using radio telemetry tags um, to actually try and pinpoint birds' movements. So that, that's something that just started a few years ago. So from the observation centre, we've moved across to the old Coast Guard station now, on top of the tower, looking up at some aerials, not for television. <laughs> no, no, these are uh, aerials associated with what's called a motor scheme, which is a radio tracking scheme um, for monitoring the movements of birds or bats, uh, which have these um, tags attached to them. Um, with the little antennae which send out radio pulses uh, and the antennae that you can see there pointing in four different compass directions um, will actually pick up these uh, telemetry um, signals. And the technology for doing this must be tiny if you think you're attaching an antenna to a bird or a bat. Yeah, it is. Um, and there are limits to the size and the weight that obviously you can attach things to a you know, small bird or, or a bat. Um, but the technology is such now that in the States they've actually been able to do radio tracking technology on bumblebees um, and... Uh, Hang on, an dragon. antenna on a bumblebee? Yes, indeed. Was, and, and, and butterflies <laughs> tracking the monarchs as they migrate through down to Mexico uh, and even larger dragonflies as well. So the potential is, uh, is quite enormous. And we could be at the forefront of it here at Gibraltar Point Skegness. We're certainly aiming to be part of a larger network, certainly around the Wash or the eastern seaboard of the UK and then connecting to the established MOTUS um, network in... On, along the North Sea coast as well, sort of in uh, Holland, the Dutch coast uh, and German coast as well. So Kevin, thank you ever so much for showing us round. Uh, a fitting end, we've got to fly past by a pair of spoonbills at the minute. Yeah, absolutely lovely. Yeah, there's so much going on at the moment and we've got swallows drifting south over the salt marsh, a couple of stone chats and a wind chat, lots of migration happening at the moment here at Gibraltar Point. What a place to work. Yeah, it's lovely. <laughs>